So you're all most welcome to the Little Museum of Dublin for the cultural part of today's proceedings. And what better way to spend Valentine's Day than at an event with love in the title uh, and in a city which holds some relics of St. Valentine, um, patron saint of love. They're just a few streets away from here in Whitefriar Street Church in one of the oldest parts of Dublin. So Valentine's Day, of course, is a global celebration of coupledom. Today, we're celebrating a different kind of collaboration, a panel discussion. Uh, culture's tall order asks if culture can foster friendship between both parts of this island. My name is Martina Devlin, and I'm joined by writers Jan Carson, and Glenn Patterson and artist Rita Duffy, whose work is featured in the exhibition upstairs. Um, they'll be talking about multiple forms of Irishness and how compatible they are. So let me introduce you to the panel. Rita Duffy has been described as Ulster's foremost artist. Her installations and projects often highlight so socio-political issues. Uh, and she uses irony and wit to interrogate Irish history and politics. Some of her work is in the permanent collections of Ireland's Museum of Modern Art and the Imperial War Museum in London. Her security barrier artwork in particular is one of the items you might have noticed upstairs, and we'll be talking about that. Glenn Patterson at the end of the row there, in case you hadn't worked it out by a process of elimination is the author of 11 novels and five works of non-fiction. Most recently, The Last Irish Question, Will Six into 26 Ever Go? Isn't that a great title? Glenn co-wrote the BAFTA-nominated Good Vibrations film, which he also co-adapted for stage at the Lyric Theatre in Belfast. He's director of the Seamus Heaney Centre at Queen's University, which makes him Professor Glenn Patterson. And Jan Carson's books include Malcolm Orange Disappears, Children's Children, Postcard Stories, and The Firestarters, which won the EU Prize for Literature in 2019. Her latest book is The Raptures. Jan was born in Ballymena and lives in Belfast, where she runs arts events for the elderly. So, Louis McNeese, the Belfast-born poet and playwright, talks about where he's from as incorrigibly plural and being various. Is that something we celebrate or do we fear it? So I'm going to go around the panel and ask this. Well, I immediately would suggest it's celebratory. Um, I think the perceptions <coughs> of Belfast as being divided and fractured and dual communities is is um, somewhat problematic in that I think there is one community with um, with two heads, which is kind of like a very much a post-colonial construct. Um, but I think what's mostly interesting about the kind of multiplicity of identities in Belfast is that we're only now starting to kind of inquire of them. Pick up that thread, Jan, if you would. Are we starting to inquire about the multiplicity of identities? Um, I think so. And I, th I think the thing from that statement that really interests me is the idea of multiplicity rather than a kind of homogenous boiling down to like being lots of things at once, but a bit beige, if you know what I mean. So you don't offend anyone, but you don't have unique identities and cultures to celebrate within that. And I think what has been interesting in the last um, period in Northern Ireland is to see um, people, you know, being proud of their history and their roots, but also open to being lots of different things at once and open to allow people to celebrate their different identities and roots as well, which is not to say it's perfect. I think there's also people that would object to that. But definitely in the art sector, I'm seeing more diverse stories, different stories, unique stories, all going into the mix. Glenn, are other voices coming through? I think the, um, that those lines of Magnesis from Snow. Yes, from um, Snow, well spotted. Which, which, is, which I think should be the national lyric. I don't think we need a national anthem, but the national lyric. 
and that um, I peel and portion the tan a tangerine and feel the drunkenness of things being various. Uh, so I love the drunkenness of things being various. I think if you do that, then you get some of the, the delirium of um, the, the, the plurality. Um, and uh, so I, are they starting to come through? I think they've always been there. I've, I think I always felt that I lived in a place where it was... Um, where there were many, many, many ways of being. It wasn't always as easy to be all the ways uh, that you felt yourself to be. Um, but I Do you mean as a cultural practitioner? I just thought, I think just, I think just, as I a always citizen. did. You know, I think we're, where are we now? 2022, and it's 24 years since the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement was four years after the first ceasefire. The first ceasefire was... Uh, half a dozen years after the um, first peace talks. I mean, we're, we're 30 odd years into trying to work out some way of being more various. And um, so it feels like that's over half my life already, just uh, tracking that back. Um, so I think, we've been, I think we've been doing it for, for quite a while and attempting it for quite a while. But I mean, I think we've we've not, known each other for a very long time. We've really. known each other for a very long and, time, but I'm not so sure that we've been doing it successfully. I mean, I, am, I would suggest that we've had a hundred years to work out, you know, the, the kind of sense of being comfortable living in Belfast. I grew up in Belfast. My father was from Belfast. My mother was from the South. But it's very interesting. My grandfather worked, was one of the few Catholic men that worked in a foundry that made propellers for boats in Belfast. He was volunteered for the First World, World War and assured that his job would be there for him when he came back. So here was a Catholic man from Conway Street off to fight for king and country. He died at the Somme and four years later, his wife and family were burnt out of their house because they were Catholics living too close to the Shankill end of the street. Um, and they went, you know, they went to live with their sister who was... Uh, loaned some money by my grandmother's war pension. Um, their youngest son, or he, his, that family started a builder's yard in the Short Strand, which is a small Catholic enclave in East Belfast. The youngest son, Frankie McCann, was a very clever young man, took a degree, started Queen's to study English, but figured that um, the English professor was an arrogant bigot, so he taught himself Irish and took a degree in Irish literature, Celtic mythology, thereby starting the Irish Studies Department at Queen's University. So I love the twists and turns of history and how families and human beings help and intercede and break down those kind of rigid boundaries that say, you're accepted, but I'm not. Um, and I think we've had 100 years of fighting and working very hard to recover some sense of equilibrium and decency, common decency in Belfast. And I think the fact that the war is over, violence has abated, we've had a breathing space to come to terms with that bigotry and that reduction of human potential. And I like to think that Belfast today has, is in a process of recovery. And now that the kind of female voice is really starting to come to the fore, I have great hopes and ambitions that Belfast will completely out, out, um, outwalk Dublin, I in, terms of, Dublin. Uh, in terms of culture and imagination. Just hold that thought on the female voice, and I'm going to go to you in a minute about it, Jan. But there was something you said that, that reminded me of a line Glenn uses in his latest book, The 26 uh, counties won and the six counties won and whether they can ever come together. You talk about negative peace as opposed to positive peace building. Mm -hmm. Explain that to us. Um, I think I'm probably quoting somebody there. and It's bad of me that I can't remember exactly who I'm quoting on that, but that... Um, I, said, well, I think sometimes uh, there's, uh, there's lip service paid to... We, we live so many different lives. I mean, we're, I mean, we're just right the war is over, whatever the war exactly was, and uh, whenever it possibly ended, even though we still have people dragged out and shot 
by paramilitary organisations, even though the numbers of people who might be participating in paramilitary organisations are higher now than they were at the time of the ceasefires, uh, even though our government uh, has uh, collapsed again. Um, so those things keep happening. And I think one of the one of the things that I wouldn't say it makes me impatient, but I keep wondering why we keep we keep looking for a new beginning. Um, where is the moment where this is supposed to have started? Because things happen in odd uh, waves. Um, I mean, I, at the time I was writing the Six Into Twenty Six book, a line I did leave out, which was that all things that have been will probably be again. And one of the things I've been thinking. Which is, which is a cause for vigilance on all of our part. Take it's kind nothing, of scary. Take nothing it? for granted. Well, history is just so long, and I think we have a, a way of thinking that our generation is fixing something or it'll never happen again. It can't happen again. And one of the things that had always seemed to me so inevitable would be another war in Europe, and uh, I don't think it would be the week after next, as it looks like it could well be. But things do happen, and they happen to people who are as modern as they have ever been, as varied as they have ever been, uh, who cannot imagine it would ever befall them uh, because of what they have done, because of how different they are from generations that went before. But these things aren't even. Um, they happen at different paces, and uh, sometimes uh, what's happening politically is not the same as what's happening culturally, and what's happening culturally isn't the same everywhere you go. And I think we just need to be a bit more uh, cautious sometimes while running after everything that is uh, wonderful in our moment and embracing all the things, as Rita says, there's so much to celebrate and so much to uh, rejoice in uh, and so much to be optimistic about. Um, I felt like that at other times in the past. Um, I felt Rita and, and I worked on something in the, in the very late 80s late 1980s, and, and it early, felt like we were 90s. at one of those moments, and that was before the ceasefires, and it felt like it's kind of all up for grabs. Isn't it wonderful? Fortnite magazine was, but it's back again, but this great magazine, Fortnite magazine in, uh, in Belfast, uh, was one of those places with all these great conversations going on about identity, north, south, east, west, uh, European. I felt giddy with it all. And, um, Is that youth? You flatter me. I wasn't even very young then. Um, it was whatever it was. It was a feeling of just of great possibility. And it's a mixture, I think, of youth and also the kind of clogged, hard, tough nature of getting anything to happen in the north. I mean, this the sense of kind of like those moments of open opportunity were just flattened. Certainly, I, I've that's been my experience. What flattened them? Bureaucracy. And when I tell you, you that there are the more, arts world, I'm though. talking about the arts world, and I'm and also the kind of the culture of like, if in doubt, say no, don't do anything, is a kind of a pervasive headspace in in Belfast. At least that's what I've discovered when since I've been working in the south. There's a sense of like that's a half decent idea, give it a lash, and a preparedness to kind of, you know, autonomously make a decision and go forward with it. Whereas in Belfast, there was a sense of like, I don't have to say, I don't have to say yes to this and, and nobody's going to come and check or, you know, and it doesn't really matter if it doesn't happen and the safer thing is to say no. And it's a bureaucratic mess, a total and absolutely dysfunctional state list that should be dismantled pronto. We have more public servants in Northern Ireland than there were in the height of the Raj during thing. Now, that fact, that number, is evidence that here we are, the very first colony, and the very last colony, perhaps. Maybe. Jan, let me bring you in there. Can I, um, can I say something in response? Please, please yeah. Say? I think Glenn said a really interesting thing about there being a difference between, like, political, political and cultural kind of leadership. And even, I think, there's something there. I mean, the question I get asked most often is, are you hopeful about the future of Northern Ireland? And I always say, yes, I am completely hopeful about it and also completely despairing. And I'm hopeful because I look at that cultural sector and I see some of the most imaginative, creative, um, brave people who have been consistently working for years and years and years under those difficult, frustrating circumstances Rita's talking about. 
And then I look at the leadership and I say the opposite and it's like there's a, a ceiling there that's impossible to get through. And I do think if, if that sector there, the young people, the people who are in the arts and cultural sector, if there's any way to move them up into more leadership where they can change legislation and change things, it's, there's an incredible amount of potential in the north. But there are dinosaurs up there that's not going to let us pass. Are you talking about politicians? Yeah, politicians and bureaucrats and funders and... Patriarchy. Um, just a, a lot of kind of... You know, when I, even when I think about the very grassroots level of what it means to practice community arts in the North, there are organisations that have people in place who only exist to search out funding to maintain their own job. Like... That's ludicrous. That's a, a completely just a daft way to be. There are people who don't know whether they have a job on Monday morning whose contracts are constantly hanging in the balance. How can you ever move past that level of bureaucracy to create something, you know, to unleash the potential that is there? Well, you have to come up with creative solutions. And I would suggest, and it's probably an interesting moment to suggest this, that we've managed to kind of cooperate north and south on lots of different things. Um, we never got a chance to vote on the British border in Ireland. I live on it. I bought a little bit of it about seven years before the Good Friday Agreement was signed. You bought a bit of it? Yeah. The border? Yeah. I bought a little bit. I bought 11 acres of ground um, in South Fermanagh. And I figured... If I wanted to see the border eradicated and gone, I really should put myself where my mouth was. <laughs> so I literally have um, a studio space and a, um, a very eco-friendly, we've built a very eco-efficient um, house there. And, and do you straddle the border? Is that yes. what you're saying? Yes, well, we close to. We're about, a, we're about a yard, we're about a mile and a half. I He's cross dangerous. The, I cross the border <laughs> twice every day. Right, so right, you live on one the side, work on the other. And think, which is very, it's a very interesting headspace, and I find it to be a very um, curious headspace for an artist, because I truly believe that Ulster is the most interesting area of Ireland f through all the complexities, but I think we're well past time in realising that we don't have a border in our imagination. And the arts councils, north and south, should be amalgamated into one provision for the arts. If like, we can the play Irish, rugby, like the Irish rugby team. If we can exactly. play rugby together with muscle, surely our imaginations, our creative imaginations, are that which brings us forward and into this kind of crucial decade where we're going to be looking at unifying this country. Um, because I think with the main politics being um, our climate change, Flags no longer interest me. Um, I'm only interested in having a safer and a healthy planet to live on. And I think we can keep the flags and identities to the Olympics, but we need to find another way of sharing this island. So is politics, uh, sorry, is culture, I should say, a unifying force? Because we know politics Absolutely. isn't. Absolutely. Yeah, what do the rest of the panel think? Culture, I think arts, I just, I think I feel bound to say, as we look at uh, reunifying the island, or not. We have to allow that it might not happen in the next decade. Um, I don't think it's a given uh, that that's well, going to happen. Well, are you prepared to go out and fight for Ulster then? No, I'm, that's, not, that's, a, that's a very different question about... It's not uh, really, because well, you're it saying is. it's no, not going to happen. It, no, I, 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 no, I didn't say it's not going to happen. I just said it might not happen in the next decade. So I think that's, you know, that's just a, a, a statement of fact. It might happen in the next decade, but it might not. Um, and I don't think we should assume that. Uh, I think that to talk about uh, reunification and not allow that it might come when we do have a vote on it, to not allow that the vote might actually be for um, a continuation of the current arrangement or something that's quite like that. I think if you don't allow that uh, as something that is a possibility, then it probably does mean that there are people who will fear that referendum. Uh, rather than think that it's something that at least allows for, in most people's imagination, the possibility that all outcomes are, are there for the voting. Well, it's very interesting because the border headspace and the rural community are very much for cooperation. Um, during the foot and mouth disease, there was no north-south 
cattle were treated all the same. During the pandemic, people in the north have been kind of bumping into each other with a lack of direction, no decision being made, no governance from the top to facilitate human health. And I think in the south, it was very different in that they had the autonomy to make decisions, to choose and to know what their budgets were. We don't even have a notion of what's being spent in the arts in the coming year or what's been spent on health in the coming year. We're at such a disadvantage with devolution from London. That's no longer a way to cooperate or act or to use our money efficiently. And after the pandemic, the economy and inflation is already impacting hugely. So I think we'd be very naive to think that we're not going to be amalgamating and facilitating our lives on this island together. I mean, the other thing is the census, which has been delayed. Yeah. But I you still know. think just to put, or not, you know, not to allow something as a possibility. Well, people I think can always have a British identity, but I mean, I think, tell me what a British identity is anymore. And we I could yeah, maybe, I don't know, it's either. We'll be on a wee sidetrack there on that one, I think. Can I just say one other thing on politics? Mm -hmm. well, is unfortunately we keep voting for the same, you know, the parties who are there, who we despair of uh, at election after election are the parties who are returned. Um, and uh, although things are, we've got another election coming in May, so we'll see what happens there. But, um, you know, I'm a little bit cautious when I blame politics and divorce that from uh, people who vote. I mean, I, I include everybody I know. I don't know how anybody how anyone I know votes, that's the, that's the nature of it. We don't know, uh, but you sort of look around and you think they didn't happen by accident, these politicians. Whatever we say, somewhere there are things, and they are fundamental, they are psychological, uh, they are about how we see ourselves and who we think ourselves to be, um, and we return political parties who um, seem to accentuate the differences between us uh, rather than to celebrate what unites us now, you know that's they're they're there because people are giving them their votes, um, and I think again uh, we have to be very careful and uh, not to think that because we feel uh, a particular way that it's uh, obvious that everyone thinks that's what, that way. So let me ask each of you in the panel then: Do artists, do arts practitioners, have a role to play in terms of? reflecting or altering, progressing the culture? We're looking at Chan. you, Jan. Oh, right, okay, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know, I'm, just, I'm still reeling from the last couple of, of comments and I'm just thinking very much about Ballymena and that, you know, Ballymena, where I'm from, where I write about, where I still go at least once a week, every week, um, you know, these attitudes, these progressive attitudes in terms of, of Ireland, it's hardened up there. It's got tighter. It's people have dug, dug their heels in. The unionist community feels under threat, and so they've dug their heels in. And you know, my world is evangelical Protestantism, and I have seen a real worry in return to politics being preached from the pulpit in churches around Ballymena, where people are being told how to vote again. The you know the minister is dictating. This is what you need to do. And there's, there's, how there's, is the minister telling people to vote when they have the opportunity? Well, I, I know at least of one large church in, in Belfast where they were told, you know, to um, to vote leave on the Brexit vote, the entire congregation. Um, I'll not name names, but th there is that culture that is, is coming back. And I think when you talk about, um, you know, is it an artist's responsibility? It's something that I felt very strongly with, with the raptures and with a lot of short stories I've written recently, that that community isn't always listened to and doesn't have a voice and I'm not condoning their politics but they deserve to be listened to and to be heard and to feel like they have a voice at the table because when they don't they dig their heels in any even further so I think perhaps that, that's what, what I've seen my role that's the world I come from it's the world I know the most it's the world my family is still in and if all I do is educate a little bit and go this is what it looks like in there and what's that community's view of the arts? They're terrified of it. Artists are, you know, the way I grew up, artists are degenerates. And, um, you know, there's the biggest fear that I always saw growing up was a, a fear of losing control. And it's why a lot of that world is terrified of things like alcohol and dancing and, and promiscuity and all this. It's a lack of control. 
And it, you can see that reflect in our politics that there's no dialogue, there's no listening. It's hold on tight to exactly what you've been taught. Because if you begin to open up and empathise even a little bit, who knows where it could go? Um, but, but isn't fear the direct kind of counter to creativity? I mean, how can you be creative and be fearful and have a siege mentality? I don't, I mean, I think those two are like polar opposites. Well, you can't, I've fought my way out from under yeah. it of being told that what I do is wrong and sinful and... Um, Writing books is sinful? Oh, yeah. yeah. Why? So, it depends what you write. If I was writing nice C.S. Lewis style books, it might be grand, mm -hmm. but I'm not. You know, I've sat under sermons where the theatre is condemned as idolatrous and promiscuous, which not, not like... 200 years ago, like 20 years ago. Um, so th it is that fear of like you go into the world, it's worldly, it's secular, it's sinful, keep away from it. Um, I don't know how we get, because there's so many talented young people in there who just need that freedom that, that Rita's talking about to be able to be creative, to be empathetic, to listen, to think, to change their minds about things. But isn't, isn't that why artists have always been the first people to be locked up, writers, poets, the people that actually challenge the status quo. Because how can you have a minister persuading a congregation of base people who are making their living basically out of agriculture to vote for Brexit? Yeah. It's kind of like go outside and shoot yourself in the head. Well, I think it's also it why, like I've always said, it's also always why the DUP really restricts the arts budget as well. Because if we give those degenerates a load of money, Dear only knows what they'll make people think and um Glenn. I'm I, I'm kind of a little bit uncomfortable uncomfortable with the idea of artists as always being challenging uh of the status challenging to challenging of challenging to challenging um of the status quo. Um I mean I think that artists are as varied as uh individual human beings as any other uh section of our society um, and uh, there are some people who will see who will who will feel that that is ind indeed what they are doing there'll be other people who are uh, very comfortable um, championing it um, you know living very well in in anywhere where they are They're, you know it's, I think we are I, I just I'm just very very concerned about generalizations uh, and I think that uh, and even talking about you know the Protestant community, as Jan described, um, you know her, it's not one her back, yeah, of course, community. you know, and that's you know there there are so many different varieties of it, and even in the uh, in in Presbyterianism, and you know you know I uh, my own first novel was uh, set in 1969. It was uh, a, a young a child a boy growing up in Belfast in, in August 1969, and I started to write that book in. 1985. I remember when I started it because I was living in England at the time. I was just uh, in Norwich, and uh, the Anglo-Irish Agreement had just been signed. There were there was that big rally in the centre of Belfast, if you remember, where Paisley said famously, "Never, never, never." It was that speech, and then they went and looted SS Moore's the sports shop, one section. And my friends were, my English friends were watching this on TV, saying, "Who the fuck are these people?" And I thought, well, if I looked really closely, I could probably identify quite a few of them because you know, I, I know loads of people who I know would be there uh, who were very concerned about the Anglo-Irish Agreement. And I thought, like Jan thought, um, well, you have to write from within this. That's where, that's where I started to write. I started to write that novel, Burning Your Own, because I wanted to write from within the experience I'd grown up in. Um, to reflect that experience? Actually, just, to, just as, as, as Jan said, I mean, you, I mean you know, you're a writer yourself. I mean, why do we do things? We, we do things, first of all, to ask questions. I think that's the other thing. We, when we write, we are asking ourselves questions. We're not writing because we have an answer. We're writing to find out something for ourselves uh, at the most basic level. Can this work? Will this work? What on earth is this I'm doing? Um, but you sort of write towards an understanding of something yourself. Um, but yeah, I was I was writing from when, within something. I thought, how can this how can this not be a known uh, part of the world? How can how can these people who think that uh, whatever five hundred thousand people or however many were supposed to be in Belfast city centre protesting against the Anglo Irish Agreement, how can they be um, protesting for a United Kingdom 
uh, for uh, um, the integrity of the United Kingdom when people who are living on the other island are sitting looking and saying, who the fuck are you? So that, to me, seemed like a fruitful area of uh, inquiry. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, I think that's very, very similar to what Jan was talking about as well. A very different kind of Protestant background I had, but, uh, you know, elements of it would be very recognisable. Mm -hmm. So I suppose there's a sense in which people in the North feel people elsewhere sneer at their culture. I mean, kind of what you're describing would speak to that. They, they feel a bit mocked, really. No, I don't, think, I don't think that's true. No? Because my culture is the very same as your culture. Sure, but the culture I'm that mine, Jan and... The culture I just Jan think keep overlapping. But I kind of think that oh. isolating, isolating yeah. kind of Northern Irish culture into a kind of, you know, Protestant... Thing, it's, that's a kind of strange perspective to come at. This, okay. Because I don't... I think my culture is very similar to yours, but I also have the added kind of complexities of having lived an, in a, from a nationalist perspective in Belfast where my father worked on the flying boats and there's huge kind of um, Ulster connections. So it's like, it's very similar to being from Kerry. Do you feel the same way, Jan? And living in Dublin, you know? Well, I don't feel like I'm from Kerry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, no, but what I'm saying is that it, it's, it's the, in comparison to a Dublin existence, being Irish and from Kerry is quite different than being from urban Dublin. And I, I think surely on this island, we have enough scope and capacity to be able to kind of engage and celebrate all of that complexity. But are we doing that? I don't think we're doing it successfully enough because we have refugees coming that are being still excluded. And there are going to be lots and lots more refugees. And I'd like to think that we could actually embrace that change and make the Irish personality larger and broader and wider, because we're going to have to. I was reading on the way down here. I'm reading. Um, this, is, this, is, um, this is such an astonishing year for new novels and books from, um, from Northern Ireland. And uh, I mean, Jan's new novel has just come out, and we were standing upstairs running down the list of uh, your new novels coming out in May. Um, we're just running down the list of new books Wendy that are coming Erskine, out. Louise Kennedy. Louise Kennedy's, uh, Lucy Caldwell, um, Michelle Gallon was one who yeah. we I had left off. So I'm reading Michelle Gallon. I think I count it 15 or 16. It's, extraor it's, it's absolutely yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. The first question they're asking at the Oscars is, where are you from? And if you're not from Northern Ireland, well, forget it, don't bother coming to LA uh, this year, same in the BAFTA, so all those things, don't bother coming. Um, and uh, Michelle Gallon's new novel, Factory Girls, is set in 1994, and I was just reading the proof of it on the way down. And uh, just at the point that uh, I arrived in Connolly, um, I was reading a bit where the central character says um, that she... Uh, she just wished that all the free staters would go away and all the British would go away and just leave um, people in Northern Ireland uh, to themselves. Uh, and, and she said, but it, oh, I, I, have, I will not do this justice and um, I should now swear prodigiously so that you can't record that, never put it out anywhere, so you just can't use that. But it's a wonderful little can't passage where she says, and she says to herself, she says, I could never say this to anybody. It's just kind of like a little bit of uh, interior monologue there. Um, but it was just really interesting. Um, uh, she, you know, Michelle Gallon uh, from Tyrone, from Castle Derg, maybe, and uh, you know, and she's writing about a very particular experience. Wonderful, wonderful uh, first novel, um, and now this uh, um, called Big Girl, Small Town, and it's a, against another perspective that uh, maybe we hadn't had before. Um, Leave us alone. Hmm? Is that the leave us alone perspective? That, well, the, that, yeah, sort of. It's, yeah, it's, um, you know. I think there's also, like, a, a, I just finished it as well. It was great. Um, I, there's a kind of solidarity thing there as well that if you're from the North, you kind of, and this is going to contradict everything from the last, like, 50, 60 years of history, but you kind of understand each other. There's, like, a, a mutual understanding of it. it. It's pretty complicated up here. And then how you see yourself and how you are seen changes depending on where you go. Like when you're in America, you have this, people interpret your cultural identity in a different way. Like I got, um, what do you call it? Um, I got grabbed by a bunch of women in Listowel the last time I was down. 
And one of them said to me, I was in the North once. <laughs> uh, and then she just had this list of questions to ask me about stuff. Like uh, what? Um, so do, what, what, what exactly is an orange man? Like, what do they do in there? Like, all of this kind of stuff. And it was like, my cultural identity looks different when I'm down in Listowel. Like, than it Glamorous does. Glamorous and exotic. <laughs> That, that to me, them as a Protestant, I represent that. There's nobody in Northern Ireland that think I represent orange culture at all. Um, so it, your, your cultural identity is shifting, and I think that's what Michelle's trying to get mm -hmm. at. Like, you know, I could be in a room with loads of people from the north here, from completely different rural, urban, different backgrounds, and there'd be a kind of sense of like, I we're we're all on the same page, sort of. <laughs> You know, and Rita, Rita, you know, we again, we we spent a lot of time working together um, at that really particular moment, and you know, the late eighties, and the very, but again, before the ceasefires, and you know, and that felt like so much a part of that building the conversation. I mean, the one thing I think everybody could agree was that it couldn't, things could not go on as they were. But then they did. Uh, well, they saw yeah, that they was, did. But that was the big disappointment I felt because well, I really did feel that the arts had a role to play in moving our society on. I mean, when I went to art school, I'd come from St. Dominic's on the Falls Road, seven years of education in a war zone where, well, it's a whole, probably a whole other talk to t kind of describe that experience of like part of the, the class feeling that the system had to be eradicated and were actively engaged with that eradication and half of the class thinking, play smart, get a job within the system and, you know, behave yourself and, you know, move into middle class. -dom. So there was a sense of kind of that dual approach to dismantling the bigotry that we were facing into. And when I went to art school, first of all, all the lectures were male. They were all from the mainland. So I was, I was somewhere kind of adrift to the west of Liverpool or something. Mm -hmm. And everything that was being looked at was what was going on in the art galleries in London and the art magazines in London. And meanwhile, I remember watching the co-op building in front of the art school melting, it, the 60s cladding, melting like some bizarre bar of chocolate. And the conversation within the art school was a kind of a quasi ineffective or amateurish philosophy towards shades of yellow and I remember thinking this is mad this is totally mad this is not a conducive or, or a creative environment and being a female you were there and considered fair play prey for a kind of a predatory attitude um, by the staff and it just felt like a very uncomfortable and a very destructive environment and I made a very conscious decision to make art about what was going on around me. And there were like two or three people in the school and you were kind of somehow considered like a mad Republican because you were making stuff that was actually about things that you were witnessing and looking at and seeing and had witnessed. So we see that, for example, with your artwork upstairs showing the security barrier at Belfast City Hall and people being, you know, patted down and frisked, which we all remember. Yeah, but that was a very early piece of work. Um, and a very, it's, it's interesting to kind of look back. It's from 86 or something. But I soon realized, well, after numerous decades working there, because I genuinely believed that it was, a, it was a, a, an ambitious and audacious thing to situate yourself right where you were, right, like Seamus Heaney said, the, the place that you were rooted in order to kind of form a voice. But I'm actually very glad now not to be in Belfast working. Right. Just, I want to bring you back to something you said earlier. You mentioned chocolate um, and it popped into my head. You made a chocolate AK-47 art installation, which was shown in Belfast and shown in London. And the audience in each place had very different reactions. Yep, that came about after a conversation. I sold a painting to an RUC detective and I remember kind of thinking, this is the first time I've ever spoken to an RUC detective. And I, I remember standing, making a cup of tea and asking him, how was the pattern report going down? And I could see the words kind of like passing through the space, thinking, did I actually say that? But sometimes the subconscious is kind of too um, ready to, to kind of 
push on. Anyway, he replied to me honestly and said it was difficult. And eventually it was a kind of a, if you ever need, if I can ever do anything for you, let me know. So I very quickly asked him, could I get access to an AK-47? To his face not drop. <laughs> and two days later, um, he came back and said, got that sorted. And I went to the weapons holding place in Carrick Fergus. And that was probably one of the most um, illuminating collections I've ever seen in terms of the ingenuity, the engineering and the lateral thinking of people from the north. If we share anything, it's that ability to make things, to see something and to copy it using a car spring or to copy. That is not a mythology. That is real. That is in my family and it is in the Ulster DNA, the making and the construction and the inventing of mechanical objects. And what I saw there was was um, probably some of the most surreal, you know, a, a, a rocket launcher using digestive biscuits to stop the shoulder being broken on the recoil, coffee bombs, things that had actually been invented to wage warfare. And I don't ever want to go back to those times. There was one room that was filled with brown manila envelopes with the forensic, the ballistics reports on every shot fired. And I kind of thought somehow looking back at it, taking those very particular things and putting them into a, a museum in Belfast would be a very good tribute to who we were and to where we might be going. But like the spy museum in Berlin. Well, I think, I think museums and history and culture has to be a guiding force and it has to draw healing out of history. Otherwise we are, as human beings, I think too easily and too readily able to say, yeah, but you know, we could go back, you know, you shouldn't do this or there's a bunch of people that are angry or, you know, it's like, it's too easy to slip back into old habits. So your AK-47, did London respond differently to Belfast? Yeah, it was shown in the ICA in London. It was chocolate and people in London smelt. Just it was a whole olfactory experience. It was just chocolate, chocolate. Wow, chocolate. And the decadence of chocolate and the, the kind of the romance of chocolate. And I had made that very specifically because I had grown up in an Irish culture of kind of the romantic hero. The, the kind of the freedom fighter, the rebel, the Che Guevara, the man who would, and the woman, who would face into imperialist injustice and defeat it. And there is a kind of a, you know, you know that's very much a part of the Irish psyche as well. Mm -hmm. Kind of taken on Goliath mm -hmm. and, and through imagination and wit and craft, outwitting the, the bully, the dominant brute, and when I showed it in Belfast, I, sh I, I specifically went to the, the headmistress in St. Dominic's um, and I said, can we, I use the study hall? And because um, I, I used, you know, basically education sets you free, not violence. Loved it. Opened the doors, in I got. And um, everybody that saw it as part of that year's West Belfast Festival immediately read the serial number and was like, where did she get? And it was kind of, it could have been made out of anything. Mm. But it was a, as an object, as an artifact. That's why I love the exhibition upstairs. Those artifacts and those objects are like very, they're much more than just playful little kind of bits and bobs. So I've always noticed that the red hand of Ulster, this emblem of Ulster, is a symbol which both communities, though I shouldn't even say two communities, but nevertheless, loyalism and nationalism um, feels it has ownership of. Yeah, but this one of them's left and the other one's right. Did you no, just make that up? No, yes, I did, 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 I did
so, but also the kind of, it seems a very macho symbol, I think, which perhaps appeals to loyalism as well. But it's interesting to speak to three people who work in the arts about symbols and emblems and how powerful they are. No? I was reading something again. What, have you come across some, some... I was reading something recently, somebody retelling the red hand... Uh, you know, the legend about cutting off the hand and throwing the hand onto the shore because, you to know... Get to, to get to Yeah, so you would, you, you would mutilate yourself. To get to, to get, Yeah, to get to Rome. Yeah, that's pretty much all about to Rome. <laughs> so, um, but, and I was reading it again and I was thinking, uh, what was interesting about it was, it was, this is something, it's almost as though these stories need to be retold and retold. And again, whatever, I, I think there's maybe, we all are guilty of this fallacy or can fall into it that what we, what we do is it, that this is the definitive version. And it's not, you know, uh, we think about how many people read even very successful novels, go to see exhibitions, and we, we think that this is part of the general uh, conversation and will remain permanently part of the conversation. And it doesn't, I mean, these things just, they, um, they exist, but they may be forgotten or it may be dispersed the meaning of it and so we have to keep we have to keep reminding ourselves and we have to keep working at uh, all the things please help me out here with an end of the sentence just somebody let something well i was struck by how there are no such mouth, thing as end. new stories and old stories they're just stories and they're there for people to reshape yeah. as they will sometimes but sometimes you read something you think it's like it's been they haven't read, didn't they read this? Didn't they read that? And the answer yeah. is no, probably not. I didn't not. read any of them. You but don't know about like, the well, red hand? Yeah. No, like, uh, we, uh, it's, like our, our, our version of Presbyterianism was completely apolitical. So anything to do with, kind of, like, it was that was the world. So don't go near anything to do with politics, symbols of, of loyalism, anything but like wasn't that. that a part of the, the, wasn't that a part of the segregated school system in the North purposefully set up? where Protestant schools did not learn Irish history? Uh, well, we didn't learn very much Irish history in, yeah. in my school, but I, I, like, what's interesting you see, is... see, I went to Catholic school and we did learn Irish history. Mm -hmm. And we learned European history and I took history to A-level. And I always thought it was really amazing that people, you could talk to somebody, you know, about living and growing up in Northern Ireland and they had no notion of Grant's Parliament or the famine or any of the major events that happened on this island. And to me, that was the kind of one of the biggest damages living in a kind of colonial construct. Because how could you not empathize with your neighbors? How could you not realize that Belfast got its population? Because people were starving and Catholics were starving and Protestants were starving and they moved into what was Belfast, a burgeoning city. I remember doing a project with women up the Shankill Road and um, I decided that we would do this whole making mashed potatoes as part of a thing. And they were like, looking at me like I was kind of some strange provocateur. And it was like one woman went out and bought chips and sat kind of eating chips with sauce as a kind of a, would you ever fuck off? <laughs> Not knowing that their, her history, her own family narrative came from that event. And it was like that, that level of ignorance is appalling. And we had such a kind of a two-tiered system of education in the North that it's done very well for some children. And unfortunately, it's Protestant working class areas that are imploding through that lack of education now. But is there not also a misunderstanding about the North coming from the Republic as well as misunderstandings within the North? And I see you nodding your head there, Glenn. Go on. No, I'm just, I'm just nodding. Yes, just... yes, I believe there is. I think Jam was about to say Jam. something. No, I, I guess I was just going to say um, I, I am that person that has no Irish history, no Irish mythology, no Irish anything, but I'm I, you know, I went to a grammar school, like, just it was a Balamina grammar school. Um, but what I was going to say off the back of what Glenn was talking about was it's it's been wonderful to come to some of those stories and pieces of history in later life and to come to them at a point 
possibly where I was able to say that there is multiple different versions of them because I think if I had been taught those stories in a Protestant grammar school in Ballymena, I probably would have just got one version of them. But yeah. to be able to space around it by poets and writers and thinkers and the wonderful people I work with in community projects and to go, like, I, 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 it's not my story because I haven't shown it to anybody, but I have a story about the Red Hand of Ulster being reinterpreted by a, a Polish man who's just moved to Belfast. And um, when I, <laughs> it's, it's a funny story, when I was writing it, sat down with my best mate, who is also from the same background as me, and we had a bottle of wine, and we tried to piece together some Irish mythology, and it was all over the show, lads. It was like, well, I think there was a big dog, and then there was a harp, and there might have been a, a fish, was it a trout of something or other? And we realised that we had all of these pieces from all over the place, and that just led me to go off and learn that kind of stuff. So I think I just would be very careful, Rita, in some of the language that you're using about people not growing up with this stuff because it sometimes can feel a bit shaming. Like I grew up quite embarrassed by the fact that I didn't know what the Easter Rising was, that I didn't know who Cahillan was. I didn't want to put my head up and go, I don't know this stuff. But that wasn't my fault. That was done to no, me. I'm not, I'm not a, a casting aspersions. It's the nature of our kind of skewed education system that I would like to see um, completely um, re reworked and reinvented to the benefit of everybody. But I mean, as far as I'm concerned, um, in mythology, the Ulster sagas are by far the most interesting um, written when, it, when they eventually were written down. And they're in the, they're in the Robinson Library in Armagh. And the genius myth of all of that Ulster saga is, is the curse of Maka, mm -hmm. where she curses the men of Ulster for nine generations for showing no compassion to a woman in childbirth. It's an amazing cautionary tale about the intertribal, internecine fighting that was evident in Ulster from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, it's also, that's a very particular very specific local narrative, but it's universal. And that's when I think you end up with great art because that particular story is on a par with any of the classics that I've read. Have artists' um, perspectives on the conflict, which you've touched on here, encouraged conversations in their communities, do you think? Anna Burns certainly has in her novel Milkman. Milkman, yeah. I think, I'm not sure what else. You know? I feel, I feel myself getting more pessimistic actually as this conversation goes on and I don't know why. I think, I think there's, I think there's, I think I just believe in middle. In middle? Middle, yeah, I just, I just sort of believe middle that. Grind. No, I just believe that things keep going on and, and we, we, can, we can try and make things we can try, all of us can try in all the things we do to be better to each other, to, be, uh, uh, to say and do nothing that encourages uh, violence um, uh, against anybody else. You know, that, that's, that's sort of what we do. But insofar as we can predict, uh, you know, arriving at a stage that is the end stage or that is the perfected stage, um, I, don't, I don't see that. And I don't know, I think that for the answer to the question, have artists been able to encourage, uh, has art been able to, to encourage conversation? Yes, probably, yes, some of it, uh, but not all of it. And not all of those conversations uh, will result in uh, any great change. I mean, I just, I, I think that, um, and that's okay. I think that's, I think that's all right, you know, that, um, that's just, it's an ongoing thing, you know, um, we, we, there, will be, there will be more stories, there will be more, there will be more, Belfast isn't the last movie that will ever be made, um, and, uh, it, you know, at the Kenneth minute, it, it, at the, yeah, Belfast, the Kenneth Branagh one, at the minute it feels like it's everywhere, and, you know, what else could there be after this? Well, something else, and in a couple of years' time, and, you know, Milkman's a really, really, Milkman's such a brilliant novel, um, in some ways, it's, it completely, the, the thing that we, I mean, Jan will, again, as, as a writer, you'll know this as well, you know, people would say, when are you ever going to stop writing about it, about there, about then? Um, and the answer is, I have no idea. 
No idea. Um, you know, it's very it's very hard not to write the stories that are that come up to the surface. Now, a, a novel like Milkman, who would have predicted that a novel set at that time in that place, exactly the sort of thing we were being told not to write about anymore, would be, you know, come along at that moment and be such a wonderful, wonderful book. And a couple of weeks ago, I heard that same conversation again. When are they going to stop writing about but who's there? who's saying when? Are you, oh, when oh, you I mean, know, it's kind of fashions come and fashion go. I actually think that there is an urgency because I've, I've experienced... Um, conversations with young people, teenagers, living in the shadow of the peace lines. We still have a city that's divided. We may have a kind of a kind of, you know, version of a, a narrative in a, in a glossy film that's going to do very well and it'll probably lift a lot of boats and I'm delighted for Ken and everybody involved in it. But I think there is a serious urgency impacting the lives of young people in Belfast where the peace process has not been effective or hasn't shone any light I also think that there are, are lots of issues in the south of Ireland that politics and kind of social development have not addressed properly. You can't get a, a home in Dublin because homes now equate to investment properties and making money. I think there's a revamp required there massively. And I think you only get middle. The bubble only goes into the centre of that spirit level when both ends are equal. So you cannot tilt off. You cannot allow injustice to, to, to prevail and you cannot allow inordinate advantage to prevail. So somehow or other, and that, this is where I think the, the idea of putting our creative and our culturally creative minds together will benefit this entire Ireland. And that's what I want to see. And I want to see new Irish people coming and living and making lives and a whole sense of kind of progress. That's urgent. You've been listening to Rita Duffy, Jan Carson and Glenn Patterson. Thank you.